Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to finally be talking about Disney, the behemoth, the giant, the unstoppable Disney. This is absolutely going to be multiple parts, four in fact, and I'm going to try and keep this on a timeline as much as I can. I know for a fact that I'm probably going to miss something in this analysis because there was just so, so much to cover, but hopefully I'll still do this topic justice. Today for our first installment, we're going to talk about how Disney started and their very early years as a corporation. So let's get into it. Walter Elias Disney, born December 5th, 1901, was the fourth son of Elias Disney, a traveling carpenter, farmer, and building contractor, and Flora Call, a public school teacher. When Walt was an infant, they moved to a farm near Marceline, Missouri, a small Midwestern town that's said to have later served as an inspiration for the Main Street USA of Disneyland. Walt began school there and showed his love for drawing and painting in these early years. After a time though, his father abandoned farming and moved to Kansas City, Missouri, where he bought a morning newspaper route and had his young sons assist him delivering papers. According to Britannica, Walt later said that many of the habits and compulsions of his adult life stemmed from the disciplines and discomforts of helping his father with the paper route. In Kansas City, the young Walt began to study cartooning with a correspondence school and later took classes at the Kansas City Art Institute and School of Design. Eventually in 1917, the Disneys moved back to Chicago and Walt was hopeful to get a job as a newspaper cartoonist. World War I changed this and he participated as an ambulance driver for the American Red Cross in France and Germany instead. When he returned in 1919, he found occasional employment as a draftsman and inker in commercial art studios where he met a man named Ub Iwerks, a young artist whose talents became essential to Walt's success. My source explains. Dissatisfied with their progress, Disney and iWorks started a small studio of their own in 1922 and acquired a secondhand movie camera with which they made one and two minute animated advertising films for distribution to local movie theaters. They also did a series of animated cartoon sketches called Laughograms and a pilot film for a series of seven minute fairy tales that combined both live action and animation, Alice in Cartoon Land. A New York film distributor cheated the young producers and Disney was forced to file for bankruptcy in 1923. He moved to California to pursue a career as a cinematographer, but the surprise success of the first Alice film compelled Disney and his brother Roy, a lifelong business partner, to reopen shop in Hollywood. Roy Disney's name isn't nearly as known to the average person, but he was a massive part of the company. It's said that while Walt was the dreamer, Roy was the doer. With him as a business manager, they resumed the Alice series, later persuading iWorks to join and assist with the drawing of the cartoons. Walt signed a contract with the distributor, MJ Winkler, for six Alice comedies at 1,500 each, followed by six more at 1,800 each, which seemed like a fortune at the time. By the spring of 1924, the Alice comedies were showing in theaters. In December, their distributor signed up for 18 more Alices for Universal Studios. More animators were hired, and in July 1925, the brothers made a $400 down payment on a 60 by 40 foot lot in Hyperion Avenue. Around this time, in July 1925, Walt also married Lillian Bounds, one of the women that worked as an inker and painter in the Disney Studios. By 1927, the brothers and their staff had produced 56 Alice comedies. The series had run its course and Universal Studios wanted something new. As a result, Disney and his team invented a character called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit who seemed destined for success. Charles Mintz, an American producer and distributor handling the Alice shorts, signed an agreement with Universal for 26 animated shorts featuring Oswald. Mintz instructed Disney, iWorks, and their small team to shoot the first picture as soon as possible. They hammered out a first short called Poor Papa in April 1927, a little over two weeks later. Later, the first film called Trolley Troubles was released and became a hit with theaters and critics. However, things were far from perfect, even in these early years. Walt soon learned that his distributor was hiring away all his animators except Oob Iwerks, planning on cutting the Disneys out of the profit stream on Oswald. 
Universal owned the rights to the popular rabbit. They thought Walt would fail without Oswald. The distributor offered Walt a handsome salary to work for him, but Walt knew he wanted to be independent, to have control over his product, so he turned them down. Walt was then stuck with no rabbit, no money, little staff, and no contract to make more cartoons. Walt needed a character to replace Oswald, a character that he controlled. I'm sure many of you know where this is going. This is when Mickey Mouse was born. Mickey Mouse's first film was 1928's Plane Crazy, inspired by Charles Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic. Walt wanted to add sound to his cartoons following the premiere of the 1927's huge sound hit called The Jazz Singer. With a lot of experimentation, time, money, and effort, he and his team figured it out. Walt was the first voice of Mickey Mouse and he'd hired an orchestra to try and play in time with the cartoon. Distributors weren't interested, so Walt had a Broadway theater premiere of the cartoon instead. The result was Steamboat Willie, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with today, as the smiling and whistling Mickey steering his steamboat often appears at the front of Disney logos to this day. This was the start of a new era for Disney. The Skeleton Dance was released in July, 1929, and with multiple successes, Disney was making a name for themselves and spending around $5,000 per cartoon. However, with success came the issues. One source writes, while Ub Iwerks was still a critical part of the team, he and Walt began to quarrel. Ub insisted on doing all the drawings himself rather than let a lesser talented in-betweener draw the cells, celluloids, in between key character positions. This slowed down the production of the cartoons and added expense to the process. Walt led every story meeting, developed ideas and gags. When Mickey was angry, Walt chided the artist for having Mickey's tail down when it should be up in anger. No detail missed Walt's eye for story and comedy. From watching audiences and theaters, he had developed a fine-tuned sense for what worked. By 1929, Mickey Mouse had become a national craze, with Mickey Mouse clubs springing up everywhere. At theaters, audiences would shout, what, no Mickey Mouse? If the little character did not appear before the film. While the company should have been profitable, checks from their New York distributor were slow to arrive. When Walt went to meet with the distributor, he was told that he could work for the distributor for a big paycheck, 2,500 a week, and that Ub Iwerks had signed on to leave Walt and work for the distributor. Once again, others were undercutting the Disney brothers and trying to deny them their fair share of the profits. Walt and Ub signed an agreement in which Ub received $2,920 for his one-fifth ownership of the Disney company. Yet others say it wasn't of stubbornness that made him leave, but Walt's. An unconfirmed account states that when a child approached Disney and Iwerks at a party and asked for a picture of Mickey to be drawn on a napkin, Disney simply handed it to Iwerks and stated, draw it. Apparently, Iwerks became furious and threw the pen and paper and stormed out, which led him signing with Disney's competitor and trying to start an animation studio under his own name. Although Iwerks did eventually return for Disney later again, I'd say it was probably a mixture of stubbornness between the two of them that even led to this falling out and the fact that Iwerks didn't really get a lot of the credit he deserved. All too often, we think that Disney created Mickey and because Walt's name is Disney and it's attached to these projects, people forget about Ub Iwerks. In this case, it's Walt's job to really credit the people that made this a reality, lift them up, thank them, and make it clear that he would not have had the success he had without them. I can't confirm this, but Ub may have had the chance to leave after Oswald the Rabbit, right before those other animators did. The fact that he stayed with Disney through those rough times only to possibly be ordered around and told draw it when they had success, yeah, that would have irritated anyone. Again, as I wasn't there and no source can really know the personal feelings that happened between the two, feel free to take this information however you want. The whole not getting credit for what's due though, just remember that for later. Losing iWorks was an absolute blow to Walt Disney. Between that, fighting distributors, and trying to retain control and ownership of his new growing cartoon, Walt suffered a nervous breakdown. In 1931, he and his wife took their first vacation in years, and Roy looked after the company in his absence. When he returned ready to work again, the Mickey Mouse Club had a million members, and Mickey was known throughout the world. Even Franklin D. Roosevelt was a fan. Licensing deals poured in, 10 million Mickey Mouse ice cream cones were produced in 1932, and the Lionel Model Train Company survived its bankruptcy in large part because of their quarter million dollar sales with Mickey Mouse rail cars. 
Mickey and Walt became synonymous with each other. According to the Archbridge Institute, the man carefully guarded the integrity of the mouse, often telling his animators, Mickey wouldn't do that. Walt used his historic skills to act out each role and each line of dialogue. Studio crews filmed Walt when he voiced Mickey to improve the accuracy of their animations. Mickey's success enabled Walt to continue to experiment, to progress in making better entertainments. More staff, more buildings were added at the Hyperion Avenue Studios. In July, 1932, he released a new silly symphony, Flowers and Trees, the first color cartoon. Flowers and Trees became the first animated film to win an Oscar. Walt was 31 years old. Walt paid employees tuition for night classes at Los Angeles's Schoenard Art Institute, driving them to and from the classes. When he had more money to invest in education, he began holding the classes at the studio, assigning a full-time teacher. The students studied anatomy and human and animal movement as Walt wanted to inject as much realism into his films as possible. The year 1933 saw the release of Three Little Pigs, the second silly symphony to win an Oscar. The cartoon took character development to a new level. The tune, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, became a hit and was played by orchestras across the nation, another first for a cartoon. Theaters put the film's name above the name of the feature film on their marquees. Disney's distributor and theaters clamored for more Pigs films, but Walt responded with his famous remark, you can't top pigs with pigs. He did not like repeating past successes. He did not like sequels. He wanted to keep moving, keep growing. Some say that Disney became a tyrant during this growth. While he wanted his writers and artists to grow, if he thought a worker was falling short, he would label them dead wood and move on. If someone is consistently not meeting expectations, it would make sense to let them go. However, Walt supposedly ruled by fear, he demanded adherence, and some claimed that everyone was terrified of him as a boss. He wasn't the boss of a small group anymore either. Since Oswald the Rabbit was around, Disney's crew expanded from six people to 187. Pluto, Donald Duck, and other classic characters emerged during this time period, as well as the idea of producing a feature-length cartoon. It fell on Roy to raise about half a million dollars for what would become Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the original Disney princess. Walt became completely absorbed in his work. The budget increased and he took inspiration from anything he could find. In 1936, Walt attended a famous annual gathering of the powerful at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California. Leaders of business and government camped out in a serene forest, but Walt could not sleep due to the roar of awful snoring, and this gave him ideas for sounds for Snow White's dwarfs. No idea or detail was too small for Walt to absorb and incorporate into his work. At last, on December 21st, 1937, the film premiered in Los Angeles. At the end of the film, the audience stood and cheered. Attendance records were broken and it generated over $8 million in box office revenue, back when an average ticket price was only 30 cents, FYI. My source claims that if you adjusted this for inflation, it's actually the highest grossing animated film of all time with over $1 billion. The films that followed, Pinocchio and Fantasia, didn't do as well in the box office, even if Fantasia is now largely considered a classic film. Dumbo, Bambi, none of them were nearly as successful as Snow White. Even so, Disney wasn't down and out. They made Alice in Wonderland, Davy Crockett, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Cinderella, Mary Poppins, and a whole host of other films in their following couple decades before they found their groove. However, what was happening when they found it? Well, this is where things are gonna start to get a little bit complicated. Now, before we get into some of these problematic beliefs, this is where I'm gonna take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. If your heart rate increases just thinking about your credit card balances every month, you're not alone in that. Debt can feel utterly crippling, but Upstart can help you back on the path to financial freedom. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off debt with a personal loan. Plus, it's all done online. And Upstart is expanding access to affordable credit because they know that you're more than just a credit score. And unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at your income and current employment to find a smarter loan rate. So it doesn't matter if you're just paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or just need a little cushion for some personal expenses. Upstart can get you one fixed monthly payment. So if you wanna find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today, make sure to go to upstart.com slash casket. That's upstart.com slash casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So go to upstart.com slash casket. 
This episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh. Can you believe there's only four months left to 2021? Things have sped up and honestly, I don't know where the year went. And I just don't feel like I have the time to meal plan all the time too, to shop, chop, and then cook. It's just so many things. But that's why I love using HelloFresh. HelloFresh sends you fresh pre-measured ingredients with mouthwatering seasonal recipes every week so you can skip the work and get to the fun part. And the fall harvest is officially, finally around the corner and HelloFresh is serving seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls. And you bet I am gonna be getting that. I'm gonna cook it and I'm hopefully gonna do it well because I think I've gotten slightly better at cooking. What's also great is HelloFresh has 50 menu and market items to choose from every week. So I don't get bored, including vegetarian and calorie smart options and even gourmet choices. So make sure to go to hellofresh.com casket14 and use code casket14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, that's up to 14 free meals of HelloFresh at hellofresh.com slash casket. Use code casket14. It was around this time that Disney's dark side began. And by that, I simply mean that if you look back at some of the cartoons in the 30s and 40s that Disney produced, well, they were questionable. It's this era that people point to as evidence that Disney was anti-Semitic, sexist, and racist. Some of the claims levied against him seem believable. Others, not quite so much. For this portion of the episode, I want to take a look at these old cartoons and discuss why people have felt this way and if Walt himself actually felt this way. Please note here that I'm primarily talking about these problems in early Disney. We'll get to more recent issues with Disney later on as I'm trying to keep this again in chronological order as much as possible. Let's begin with the accusation that Disney was racist. According to one source, These charges stem primarily from the use of racial stereotypes in Disney movies from the 40s. Dumbo's Black Crows, Fantasia's Black Servant, and Song of the South, a movie so offensive that the Disney company will no longer let it be seen in public. Then there is Walt Disney's own behavior. Gabler cites a meeting in which Disney referred to the Snow White Dwarves as an N-word pile and another in which he used the term piccaninny. A biography about Walt Disney notes that Disney anticipated the Song of the South controversy and attempted to make it less racist with a rewrite and meeting with the NAACP. The meeting never happened and the movie was released anyway. There was also some controversy about the company's unwillingness to hire minorities at Disneyland. Now, I did take a look at the Song of the South and I mean, yeah, there's absolutely no denying the racism in this film. I think what especially bothers me is the fact that Disney knew it was problematic and then still released it anyway. The NAACP says that in effort to neither offend audiences of the North or South, the production helps to perpetuate a dangerously glorified picture of slavery. The film unfortunately gives the impression of an idyllic master-slave relationship, which is a distortion of the facts. In the movie, the actors and actresses are shown to be happily enslaved, which is not only blatantly untrue, but disturbing and insulting. Even though Disney seemed desperate to forget or push aside this film itself, the characters, songs, and locations all form the basis for a log flume ride at Disneyland and Disney World. IndieWire also writes about that and says, when Disney began re-releasing many of its flagship animated titles in the 1980s to capitalize on nostalgia, Song of the South returned to theaters. Despite the negative light cast by the film in 1946, the film still resonated with audiences 40 years later in 1986. It netted more than $17 million when it toured theaters a second time. Now again, Disney had a chance 40 years later to make this right. They could have realized that once again, the Song of the South was racist and prioritized human rights and equality instead of money. However, racism was prevalent in early films, but even if Disney had apologized and not revived this film, not referenced it, then maybe I would say they're trying to leave their past behind, but the fact that they made $17 million off of it in the 80s, that just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It took petitions on change.org to even get Disney to change their log ride. One source claims that these petitions began in 1989, only three years after the movie had been re-released. So it's not as if such a blatantly racist film was perfectly fine back then either. These racist films have never been fine to clarify. That's only to say that it's not as if these films were accepted by all in the 80s as people became more educated about the harm these stereotypes have. I really appreciate the way that some networks have handled the situation as well. UK pay TV broadcaster Sky added a disclaimer to the original 1941 Dumbo, the original 1961 The Jungle Book, and the original 1992 Aladdin, and around a dozen more films. 
When you search for one of these movies on Sky Cinema, a subscription service that houses Sky's on-demand movies, the description of the movie reads, this film has outdated attitudes, language, and cultural depictions, which may cause offense today. HBO Max recently pulled 1939's Gone with the Wind, a monument of American film history, criticized for featuring black stereotypes and romanticizing the South during the era of segregation. Gone with the Wind returned to HBO Max with a four and a half minute video introduction by black scholar Jacqueline Stewart to provide more context and help educate about racism. The point isn't simply to forget that this happened, but to learn from it. Gone with the Wind is seen as a classic film. We don't need to erase it and pretend it doesn't exist, but educate everyone that watches it in the present day. With Song of the South, if Disney insisted upon bringing it back to theaters as it was a classic work of animation featuring actors and animated characters, then they could have educated their audience. They had the chance to speak to the NAACP, but didn't take it. Worse yet, aside from the re-release in the 80s, they profited off Song of the South yet again when they released a film as a home movie in the EU and Asia in the early 1990s. I understand that to some of you, this may seem like ancient history and it's not worth criticizing Disney over, but learning from past mistakes is important and it just doesn't feel like Disney was willing to do that. Take Peter Pan, for example. This is the movie that refers to a Native American tribe as a pick, pick a nanny, pick a ninny warriors. I don't know what that word is. There's even a song called What Made the Red Man Red. They're called Injuns and Redskins. Yet back in 1953, the animation in this movie was incredible and became a box office hit. I'm not saying that we need to erase this racist past. I'm just saying that we need to learn from it and why this happened. Disney Plus is thankfully doing that with some of these old films. According to the New York Times, before viewers watch some of these films that entertain generations of children, they will be warned about scenes that include negative depictions and mistreatment of people or cultures. The 12 second disclaimer, which cannot be skipped, tells viewers in part, these stereotypes were wrong then and are wrong now. Rather than remove this content, we want to acknowledge its harmful impact, learn from it and spark conversation to create a more inclusive future together. In addition to Peter Pan and Dumbo, the warning plays on films including The Aristocats, Aladdin, and directs viewers to a website that explains some of the problematic scenes. In The Aristocats, a cat with slanted eyes and buck teeth is a racist caricature of East Asian peoples with exaggerated stereotypical traits, the website says. The cat song about egg foo young and fortune cookies, westernized foods, mock the Chinese language and culture, it says. The disclaimer follows a similar yet less extensive warning from Disney in 2019 that told viewers, this program is presented as originally created. It may contain outdated cultural depictions. As pleased as I am that these disclaimers exist now, I understand why people would be bothered that they need this in the first place. Some sources cite that Disney has genuinely improved over the years as Pocahontas clearly portrayed colonization as something negative. Others say that Pocahontas romanticizes and skirts over the atrocities committed by Europeans against Native Americans and is far from historically accurate. Whether or not you think Disney improved over the years, I think it's important to recognize and learn from the past. And believe me, we will get into more of their recent issues in a later episode, as there's still a lot more uncomfy ground to cover here. This is just their origin story, a focus on the early years. I haven't forgot that they tried to actually trademark an entire culture's holiday, but we will get there. Another claim infamously levied against Disney is that he was anti-Semitic. I have heard and believed this for many years, so I wanted to take a look at this for some evidence to prove or even potentially disprove this claim. One of my sources writes, there's the famous three little pigs scene in which the wolf was portrayed as a Jewish peddler. The scene was later reanimated. And there is the fact that in 1938, a month after Kristallnacht, Disney personally welcomed Nazi director Leni Riefenstahl to his studios. Kristallnacht, for any of you that don't know, is the Night of Broken Glass, and it's an infamous night in World War II history when about 30,000 Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. In Walt Disney, The Triumph of the American Imagination, the most thorough biography of the mogul, Neil Gabler explores the rumors, but argues that Disney practiced tolerance in his home life. There is some dispute whether the same spirit of tolerance extended to the studio, but of the Jews who worked there, it was hard to find any who thought Walt was an anti-Semite. 
Gabler posits that the charges stemmed less from personal behavior and more from Disney's association with the very anti-Semitic Motion Picture Alliance, which the CEO founded after a particularly bitter labor dispute in 1941. Even if he wasn't personally anti-Semitic, Gabler allows that Disney willingly, even enthusiastically, embraced anti-Semites and cast his fate with them. We could leave it at that and say, there we go. Whether Walt was anti-Semitic or not, he did associate with them. But I genuinely wanted to see if there was any other further evidence. After all, the same source I used earlier where a former worker called him a tyrant has another worker stating it was preposterous to call him anti-Semitic. This statement came from the son of a Jewish immigrant and composer of Mary Poppins, Richard Sherman, who claims that he and his brother, Robert, his writing partner, were treated like sons by Disney. You can still have Jewish people in your life and be anti-Semitic, just like how someone can claim they aren't racist because they have a black friend, all while saying incredibly racist things. Sherman says he never feared Disney and that he was a fantastic boss, not a tyrant. Is casual anti-Semitism okay? No, absolutely not. And it's a good thing that it makes us uncomfortable today. Casual racism shouldn't be accepted. At the same time, we need to understand that for this era, it was alarmingly normal, even among elites like Henry Ford, who was notoriously anti-Semitic. I'm not excusing racism or anti-Semitism, no matter the scale. It's just important to recognize that for his time, Disney may not have been any more anti-Semitic than the average person. At least that's the argument that Gabler makes. Also, I'm not saying that anti-Semitism doesn't exist today. Jewish persecution still exists. It was just far more normal before World War II. According to The Atlantic, the horror of the Holocaust made overtly anti-Semitic ideas and policies unacceptable in mainstream US society. The number of Americans who heard criticism or talk against Jews, according to the historian Leonard Dinnerstein, declined from 64% in 1946 to 12% in 1959. But back to Disney, what about the other people he associated with? Well, the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals was high profile at the time with many well-known members and claimed to defend against communist infiltration into the States. The second Red Scare being massive at the end of World War II, this is hardly surprising. One book about the topic says that the claims about them having strong overtones of anti-Semitism and Jim Crowism were published by their competitors, such as the Hollywood Guilds and Unions Meeting. Maury Reiskind, a Jewish writer on the MPA, contested these claims, though the accusation they were anti-Semitic has stuck. Other sources confidently claim that the MPA was anti-Semitic, but Walt Disney may have only joined because he wanted to fight communism after the animator strike of 1941 a strike which he believed had been instigated by communists. And we'll talk about that strike again in the next episode. Again, this was the second Red Scare. Fears of communism were everywhere, no matter how rational or as that was more likely, irrational they may have been. Although I can't definitively confirm or deny if the MPA had any anti-Semitic beliefs, the other accusation about Disney speaking with a Nazi filmmaker, well, that one seems a little more obvious, right? Disney allowing Lenny into the studio has inspired these anti-Semitic claims for decades now. Yet the Jewish virtual library themselves poses that Disney may have simply been trying to treat her as a fellow filmmaker rather than the pariah she'd become as every other studio at the time had actually turned her away. Among the backlash, Disney lied, claiming not to know her though. Their exact wording was, for her Hollywood stay, Riesenstahl booked a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Despite a hostile press and the billboard equivalent of Lenny Go Home, the world's most famous or infamous female director gained an audience with Walt Disney, although he did refuse her offer of a private showing of Olympia. He was just too afraid of a possible boycott of Disney films. Other studio heads treated her like the pariah she had become, refusing to see her at all. An invitation to meet with Gary Cooper was suddenly and regretfully canceled. Even Disney would later make the unconvincing claim that he hadn't known who she really was. Although her films have had enormous impact on world cinema, the woman herself found it difficult to gain public respect. Her attempt to revive her directorial career in the 1950s proved futile. The often imitated, seldom honored artist remained a controversial and unrepentant pariah up until her death on the 8th of September, 2003. Ironically, her own well-crafted black and white motion picture images of Hitler, Nazi pageantry, and the Jesse Owens Olympics helped keep both her genius and her past alive. In the words of Ray Mueller, director of the documentary, The Wonderful, Horrible Life of Lenny, her talent was her tragedy. 
So this begs the question, does being kind or at least not hostile to a Nazi make you an anti-Semite? We know that it's not a good look to accept people with such disgusting beliefs, but is there more to Walt than that? Let's try to look at it from a modern perspective. Many of you may know someone that's involved with or sympathetic to QAnon or anti-vax or voting fraud conspiracies that are absolutely dangerous. Does reaching out to them and allowing them into your home mean you agree with them? I would argue not. And in some cases, you're forced to live with them and you don't really get a choice in the matter. And being in close proximity with one of those people doesn't mean it's just gonna rub off on you and make you that. But does this also mean that this was a smart move to do this and that even though he was trying to see her as a filmmaker and not as, you know, part of the Nazi party? I don't know, it's, it's just really, really gray and I can see how a lot of people took it the way they did. I can understand where the New York Times was coming from when they publicized that Disney had done this and I can understand why people would be hurt by it or say that at the very least, it's not a good look. The only real point I'm making out of this is that I was surprised that there just wasn't this like fountain of solid evidence that he was anti-Semitic and that this is where the root of it really stemmed from. I'm not saying that this makes Disney an amazing person or anything, just maybe not as anti-Semitic as some people may have believed. There is consistent evidence that he cared about Jewish people in his lifetime as well. Disney gave to the Hebrew Orphan Asylum of the city of New York, Yeshiva College, and the Jewish Home for the Aged, and was voted 1955 Man of the Year by Beverly Hills Lodge it's also worth noting, just as Nazi filmmakers made propaganda against Jewish people, it was Disney's company that was hired to turn out films for the World War II war effort. To meet the demand for war films, everyone at the studio worked six days and two nights a week. Prior to the war, Walt Disney Productions had produced about 30,000 feet of film a year. During the war, this rose to 300,000 feet per year. The company had offered to donate the films to the war effort at cost, but government bookkeepers wrangled with Walt over every penny of expense, while Walt focused on making great films, spending what he felt was required. The 40s weren't good for the company because of their profitless war films, yet it definitely gave the company more recognition. In 1943, the New York Times even called Donald Duck a salesman of the American way, a title that may as well belong to Walt Disney himself by that point. Disney designed the book, The Victory March, to teach children the importance of saving stamps for war bonds, and even Mickey Mouse himself was seen building planes for victory on munitions factory logos. Sure, this isn't complete and total evidence that the company or Walt himself wasn't anti-Semitic, but it seems to add to the large amount of proof that he wasn't, as opposed to the few pieces of evidence that say otherwise. Now, sexism is another massive accusation that's been hurled at Disney. Meryl Streep herself called Disney a gender bigot. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Streep quoted Disney animator Ward Kimball, who said he didn't trust women or cats, and she read from a 1938 letter from Disney informing a female job applicant. Women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen, as that task is performed entirely by young men. For this reason, girls are not considered for the training school. The only work open to women consists of tracing the characters on clear celluloid sheets with India ink, and then filling in the tracing on the reverse side with paint according to directions. Is this sexist? Absolutely, I'm not trying to excuse it, but again, I also have to say it was unfortunately and devastatingly normal for that time period. That practice was not exclusive to Walt. One animation expert said it was industry-wide and a number of women working at Disney at that time were within story development. In 1941, Disney told male artists working with Dumbo that if a woman can do the work well, she is worth as much as a man. The girl artists have the right to expect the same chances for advancement as men. And I honestly believe that they may eventually contribute something to this business that men never could or would. That simply just doesn't sound sexist to me. Years later in 1959, he wrote that women are the best judges of anything we turn out. Their taste is very important. They are the theater goers. They are the ones who drag the men in. If the women like it, to heck with the men. I can't call Walt out for being sexist or partaking in an industry-wide practice. The industry itself was a sexist one, but Walt seemed to be doing right by the women in his individual company. Articles such as a 2015 one from Vox titled, Read the Rejection Letters Disney Used to Send Any Woman Who Wanted to Be an Animator. One specific 1938 letter from Disney read, your letter of recent date has been received with the inking and painting department for reply. Women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen as that work is performed entirely by young men. Again, this whole letter, 
that did happen. This was written. This is sexist without a doubt, but the industry as a whole was also quite sexist in this way. This does not excuse Disney and this does not excuse the industry, but it is unfortunately a look at the lens of the past and how things were once acceptable that are just not acceptable now. So what about Disney World? What about the present day? Disney has become one of the largest and most recognized companies in the world. So in our upcoming episodes, we're going to take a look at how they grew after the 40s and after World War II and how they got to where they are today. We'll get into that in part two, so be on the lookout for that. And I'll see you really soon. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so you don't miss any of my episodes, but especially this four-part series. Thank you again for sticking around to the end. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 